so inshallah today we'll be discussing because uh the um the day of qurban is coming up yom al-nahr is coming inshallah ta'ala so we wanted to refresh our memories about qurbani inshallah ta'ala the blessings the reward of it uh the reason why we do it and additional rulings that we'll speak about the side and inshallah we'll also discuss about um the day of arafah a little bit and then the takbirat because many people forget about that so that way inshallah whoever listens to it today will have a good amount of information about this and at the end we'll have a q a if you have any questions inshallah you feel free to ask as well um because it is, is a, a wajib of the deen so you don't want to play around with it right we want to make sure that we address it as properly as we can inshallah so let's get started so i'm going to first talk about what is udhiya what is qurbani okay qurbani is actually like a farsi word it comes from persian right from qurban it means to become close right the act of sacrificing animal to become closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very much found in our deen there are many instances of it right if you think about it we'll find a couple of them in the quran right um, probably the earliest one that we know of which is habir and qabil right one of them had to slaughter like they both had to give their best stuff to allah for whatever decision they needed and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from habil which was the animal he sacrificed an animal and it was accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another instance we find where uh when the yahud or rather bani israel at the time Musa alayhi salam, a person got killed in the community. And what did Musa alayhi salam tell them to do? Slaughter an animal, right? Slaughter a baqarah. So you can see that there's always instances of it. And it always gets you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the idea here. Udhiyah is also the word that's more commonly used in months like Arabs and Arab countries. They, it's just a sacrifice of an animal. The reason why we say qurbani just holds a bit more weight to it. Because it shows that when we sacrifice the animal, we're attaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to remember that. This is the thing. And I want to remember, I want to stress this point from the beginning to the end, inshallah. Is that the Prophet said, you will receive the full reward of your qurbani when you give it on tibi nafs, with full contentment, contentment of the heart. If you are giving the qurbani with the feeling like it is a penalty, then don't expect anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a lot that talks about Arab, it talks about Bedouins in the Quran. They say, They take whatever they spend as a penalty, as a tax. So if you're thinking this is a tax, a penalty, you're not in the right business here. Tell yourself, whatever animal you're giving, give it with shukr. I met, mashallah, this one brother, who for the first time in his entire life, is giving an entire cow. And he's like, and I asked him if he needed some help. Because let's be honest here, it's not the easiest thing to spend on. He's like, nah, I'm doing this myself. I'm really happy to do this. Now they accept it from me, accept from us as well, inshallah. Okay? So now the udhiyah must be performed through giving an animal. You can't just give away sadaqa. We're going to get to that in a second, inshallah. You must give the animal. You cannot give sadaqa in, in, in placement of that. Okay? This animal is purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Its meat is a mercy from him for us to partake on. Meaning what? That you actually, like Islamically speaking, it was never a right for us to even eat from it. But it's a mercy from Allah that you and I can eat from it. Because it's sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu But in reality, if it's for Allah, can you take from take anything that belongs to Allah? Of course not. Like, imagine you could take a portion of your zakat and have it. It's not possible. But Allah then made qurbani such a blessing that you and I can actually take some of that meat and take it back home and eat from it. Or else, reality, you just went straight to the poor, right? So, it's it's so qurban to Allah. It's so qurban. You let me use that word. It's so given to Allah that even it's, if you wanted to, if you had the animal in like, because we keep our animal for a couple of days, we feed it, whatever, back home, right? Uh, if you have the cow and it starts to milk, you're not even allowed to milk it and use the milk. It's makru. If it's a sheep, you want to shave it so you can use the wool, that's makru too. Because this is supposed to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't touch anything from that animal anymore. Okay? So now, this is how much it has to go to Allah. The Prophet promised magnificent rewards. Amazing rewards. Of course, we know Hadith of Bayhaqi. The Prophet said, whoever sacrifices an, uh, an udhiya, a sacrificed animal, he is forgiven by Allah. Another Hadith says that the animal will be brought on the day of judgment. And it should be increased in weight 70 times more than its own weight. So it will be increased 70 times. And thereafter it will be placed on the scale of deeds. So this is a very weighty um, act of worship by Allah. And the next word, the hadith of the Prophet 
it's a it's a long discussion. I want to narrate it in full. They said, Ya Rasulullah, ma hadil adahi. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, what are these sacrifices? What are these sacrifices? The Prophet sallallahu responded, Sunnah to Sunnah to Abikum Ibrahim. It is the Sunnah of your father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay. Now, mashallah, this should inspire anyone that if I want to follow the prophets, this is what they used to do. And the, one of the greatest of all prophets is Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay. That should be more than enough. But Sahaba radiallahu anhu were good people, and they wanted to know Ajr. They said, "It's great that my dad did it, but I want to know what I will get." So they said, "Famalana ya Rasulullah, what will we receive? What what will we receive, ya Rasulullah?" So the Prophet said, "Likuli sha'ratin hasana." For every hair on the animal, you receive a good deed. For every hair on the animal, already you're not going to be able to count the animal, the hair on hair on a cow, right? But the Sahaba radiallahu anhu again were just they're so uh, when when they thought about good deeds, they tried to make sure they got out as much as they could from the Prophet sallallahu so he said, Fasufu ya Rasulullah, what about the wool? What about the wool? And the Prophet said, you know, this type of questioning generally Sahaba would never do. Right? They wouldn't, they just Samir and Allah ta'ana. But this is exciting for them. Because they're like, we get Ajr, what about wool? <laughs> so the Prophet sallam, tells them, he said, Likulli sha'aratin, uh, uh, likulli, um, uh, sha'aratin min sufin hasana. The Prophet sallam, said, every hair of wool is one good deed. You can never ever count that. You can never ever count that. Why did I start with the rewards? Because we live in this weird time where you find people, and this is this is from from you know for centuries, but we live in a really weird time because of COVID-19 or whatever. People are like, don't give the qurbani, don't give the, the animal, rather give sadaqah. Give sadaqah. Just feed the poor directly. Because this is not gonna benefit anyone. Just go and give money, you know, help people out, whatever. Okay? So they consider this action to be futile. It's not worth it. Okay. I want to let you know that this is not a new issue at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with this directly in the Quran. Okay? The ayah that says, Allah says the flesh and blood will never reach Allah. Was it really about the animal? If Allah says the blood and flesh will never reach him, the meat doesn't reach him. The blood does Allah receive anything from the animal? No. Walakin, Allah says, but minkum. Your taqwa will reach him. The point is this: it's never been about the animal. The point is this, is that are you aware, are you and I in, uh, aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to give an animal? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to give an animal. Are we going to do it or not? Because if you can give it and you tell yourself Allah told me to do it, although I don't see Allah, but I know he commanded me and I give it afterwards, that's taqwa. That's taqwa. That's what Allah wants to see. He just wants to see if you're going to do it or not. It's nothing else besides that. It's nothing else besides that. Okay? We have to remind ourselves here is that the, the question comes when people start to say that I just want to give the, the uh, I want to give like, I want to give sadaqah directly to the poor. I don't want to go for like, and this, this question comes up really in weird, weird places too. Why should I go for hajj? I don't want to benefit the Saudis. I want to give money straight to the poor. Weird stuff like that you hear, right? Who is your rub? Is it Allah or is it your mind? Is your brain your Lord? It, okay, my mind is telling me that Allah is not correct here. Allah inter and wanted something else. Okay, sure. Can you show me the Prophet said that? Are you a better interpreter or the Prophet Are you a better interpreter or the Sahaba radiallahu Are you a better interpreter than, or our scholars? If our ulama haven't said it, why are you and I saying it? Okay, and can we show it definitively? We can't, this is the problem here. So now you have to ask yourself, as Aqlan, let's just bring it intellectually speaking, because I just want to kind of like beat this to the ground so that no one else <laughs> brings it up again. If, uh, if would Allah command senseless bloodshed? Do you think Allah is just asking you to kill an animal? Right? Do you think that Allah is going to command all the Muslims in the world to give up a, a qurbani and therefore all the sheep in the world become extinct? Does that ever happen where you've never found any more sheep? You want to know something amazing one sheikh said? He said that if you look at the haram animals in the world, dogs, he said the haram dog, they, they have an entire pen. When they give birth, they give birth, birth to an entire pen right, of animals. Right? A dog gives birth to like nine dogs. How many animals does a sheep give birth to? Just one, right? Or how about, how, much, how about a cow? You don't find twins, right? <laughs> like very rarely, you know, what I'm trying to say is, and what the Shaykh was trying to explain, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it that in the dunya we sense, the halal animals are producing less, but you always find more. Because baraka, you can't put a number on. So haram, although might be more out there, but there's no baraka in it. That's why when riba is, is, is a lot, Allah will wipe it out completely in a single instant. Whereas barakah, halal, risk, you can't, you can't put a number on that. 
Similarly, when it comes to animals too. So we have to remember these things. As Muslims, you can't let yourself, and I'm telling you this as a reality, when, when, because we have people who are in the slaughterhouse business, right? They say that when Eid al-Adha comes, the time comes, they have protesters outside of their, their facilities putting up signs saying that you are killing animals, Muslims are bad, whatever it is, right? They're just saying, you know, vegans this, vegetarians this. And look, you know, as Muslims, you have to remember these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made these animals for you and I. You wouldn't, you, this merciful Allah, Rahman, you think he's going to make you take an animal? The animal is literally going to come on Qiyamah and make dua for you. You eat it in the halal way. I'm not saying to go and like have like a, we all, we would do it anyways. We eat like to our three, four, four, four thirds, right? In Ramadan. But like, um, what I'm trying to say is that when we, when we eat these animals, always remember we said it with the Bismillah. We took permission from Allah to do it. That's the entire point of the hand slaughter. That you said Bismillah on every animal saying, I took permission from Allah to do this. Allah, if Allah didn't want, if Allah didn't want it, he'd never let you touch these animals. It's mentioned in, in the narration that Adam and Islam's time, they didn't eat anim animals because of the fact that um, first and foremost, there weren't so many. And it was a mercy from Allah to Nuh After the flood, Allah gave permission to the humans at that time, saying that uh, Allah says, this is my, my blessing to you. I give you permission now to eat from these animals with my name provided. It's a blessing that Allah gave as a nirmah from him. In any case, as a side point. But so now Islam teaches us to use our mind, of course. Okay. But not about his commands to reject him. A person cannot say that I want to reject Allah's command. That's why I'm thinking about these things. So rationally speaking, I figured it out. Allah Ta'ala wasn't right on this or there was a different way to do it. Allah Ta'ala protect us from that. And now the rational equivalent of this, if a person were to say, I don't want to give a qurbani, I don't want to give an udhiya, because it's better to give my money for the poor. It's the same if someone were to tell you, hey, I don't want to pray Zohar right now. I think it's, going to wait. it's a waste of time. Rather, let me go and help the poor. What would you tell that person? Are you, in, are you, are you crazy? Are you jahil? If Allah Ta'ala told you to do it, you do it. <laughs> you know, no matter what you think your time could be better used for, it can be used for whatever. If Allah put a time on it, you do it. Now Allah Ta'ala said your, t your money of 400, 500 dollars, whatever it might be, is going to be used for qurbani. It's going to be used for udhiya. Don't start to use your brain and tell yourself that this is a better way of using it. Because your brain will never be able to fathom what Allah Ta'ala knows. Okay? Now you and I are getting the point here. This is not about an animal. This is not about the, the, the slaughter of sheep and cows and whatever. This is just seeing if you will submit or not. What is Islam? Submission. This is why Qurbani Udhiya is the highest level of Ibadah. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said it, that the best days to worship Allah are the first 10 days of Zul Hijjah. And the best action on the day of sacrifice is to sacrifice an animal. Meaning that is the greatest action because it doesn't have any rational point to it. Like in the sense of like, Rationally speaking, can you like explain it to me? It's kind of hard to do, right? Honestly, right? Because why? Because Allah just wants to say, it wants to show us that if I said it, will you do it? And if Allah said it, I'll do it, okay? And if we can acknowledge to ourselves that, look, the money is not even mine, then you reach the point. Because the money in my bank account is not mine. When Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a little bit of it to make me buy something, I have to accept it that Allah said that it's his money and it's going to wherever Allah wants, okay? Now, who was the man who said, I submit everything to Allah? Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is why everything's just based off of what he did. Because if you and I are having trouble understanding why we have to sacrifice an animal, <laughs> what did he have to go through? At any point when the dream came, he's slaughtering, he's sacrificing his son. His wife, shaitan came to his wife, shaitan came to his kid, shaitan came to him. Right, Shaitan kept telling him, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Right, and then he, kept, he could rationalize. He could say that maybe my dream can be interpreted in a different way. Maybe slaughtering my son could mean that I'm going to have to give away my, my, my house fee sabirillah or my wealth fee sabirillah. You know, dream interpreters can give you crazy stuff, right? They'll make Spider-Man jump into chocolate syrup mean that you're going to have a lot of risks in your life, mashallah. You're going to have three kids or something, you know? They, dream interpreters can do that. He's, he's clearly, mashallah, he can do it. But the point is what? It's a test. Are you willing to do it or not? Are you willing to do it or not? You not, and people, people mistake this. They keep forgetting this point. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had no rational way out, right? And people think that Allah Ta'ala was trying to force him to sacrifice the son. Did Allah, did Allah really want his son to be sacrificed? Think about it. Allah Ta'ala knows the future. He already knew how great Ibrahim alayhi salam was. He already knew how great Ibrahim alayhi salam was. He knew all along. Who did Allah want to, to for, who did Allah want to know or to understand? How great Ibrahim was, he wanted you and I to understand it. So Allah Ta wanted us to know how great he was. So then he puts this entire test. He showed you how, how boss is Ibrahim 
alayhi salam, that in, even in those moments he's willing to sacrifice everything for Allah. Then Allah says, now from now till Qiyamah, every single Muslim that will come will continue to sacrifice. Will continue to sacrifice. Okay? So we have to remember these things, inshallah. When anyone asks us these questions of Ibrahim alayhi salam, don't get scared. Oh, why would God allow uh, Ibrahim to sacrifice his son? He, did, he, did he sacrifice his son? No. Did God know it? Yes. Who was he trying to teach? You and I. That's it. Question's over. Did Ibrahim alayhi salam do it? Mashallah, he went to the, to the limit and he passed the test beautifully. And Allah shows when, when you listen to him, Allah will make your lineage, your progeny, your, your generations, everything about you last till the day of judgment. That's the point here. That's why you have to remember that, look, if my brain doesn't, ma doesn't understand, that doesn't matter. Because Allah Ta'ala knows best. That's why we say it. May Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. Now, I hope that made it clear, inshallah, as it's just as a side point. So now, the, the main thing is what? That we have to strive to perform the udhiyah as much as we can, inshallah. Ibn Umar radiallahu narrates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he lived in Medina for 10 years. And for every single year, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa performed the udhiyah. He never missed it, alayhi wa sallam. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ, he made this, he made a stern warning. He said, whoever has the capacity to sacrifice an animal, but he does not do so. The Prophet ﷺ made it clear, do not come near our Eid prayer. You're not even allowed to come on our Eid day. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is how stern the ruling is, that people have to do it. They make it, make it happen, inshallah. And you should do it again with a happy face, a content face, that I'm listening to Allah. I don't understand it completely. But my Lord is accepting it, and that's all I care about. He'll make it beautiful, he'll make it pure, inshallah. May Allah accept it from us. Now, continuing, the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever sacrifices before the Eid prayer, he only sacrifices for himself. If you end up sacrificing the animal, and just, you know, before the Eid Salah is done, you're supposed to go after Eid Salah, right? If you do it before Eid Salah, the Prophet ﷺ said, that's lahmu shat, or shatu lahm. It's just some, some meat of a goat. You're not going to benefit from that. But the Prophet ﷺ says, Woman, Zabaha, Bad Sada, Fakatama, Nusukuhu. The Prophet ﷺ, whoever sacrifices after the prayer, then he's fulfilled his act of worship. Okay? Now, in terms of rulings, and that's, that's pretty much the, the emphasis that we want to put on it, that we remind ourselves first and foremost of the command of Allah. And it's not going to make complete sense to us because the point is just submission. Just do it for the sake of Allah. Even if the virus is out, even if you know, people are needing this and that, you have plenty more wealth to give. You're playing more wealth to give. If it gives you a feeling of giving, then give without Allah forcing you to do it. Right? We should give sadaqah because we want to give. Why are we only upset when Allah tells us to give? Oh, I think I know a better place to give it. If Allah told you to give it, give it in the right place, inshallah. Okay? In terms of essential rulings, the primary ruling that I want everyone to recognize, inshallah, is who actually has to do it. It is wajib on every Muslim, male or female, that owns an islab to slaughter, uh, they, they have to slaughter a sheep or one seventh of a big animal, uh, which means a cattle, a cow, or a camel. Okay, so again, it's wajib on every mature Muslim male or female right, who owns an isab to slaughter one sheep or one seventh of a big animal. Okay, and so what we find is it's the four conditions are Muslim, sane, not crazy, right? Balik, meaning that someone's re attain, uh, attained the age of puberty and should make you kind of think that maybe my kids. Might also have to give, right? But let's look at the last condition, which is nisab. Okay? Nisab is slightly different. If for zakat, right? Zakat is what? You don't, you don't really consider your personal assets. What do I mean? If perhaps brother Muhammad or Abdullah, whatever, has like 50 personal cars. Every single Lamborghini he has online, mashallah, he has all of them. Okay? But he says, they're all for my personal use. Does he give zakat any of the cars? No, he doesn't. Because they're all personal. Okay? And that's what Sharia will tell you. Wow, Sharia is so great. I should follow this Islam. Yeah, trust me. Mashallah, it's great. Okay, but if, if but the Nisab for Qurban is slightly different. Even if he has one extra car, it, that one personal car is his, is his needs and necessities. He needs that one car. Do you need the second car? Brother, I do need it. No, you don't need it. Okay, you don't need it. So the second one, you don't really need. Right, it's a, an extra car. So that one will consider in Nisab. Okay. So Qurbani, in other words, is much more flexible. Now all the clothes in your house come into play. Right? In Zakat, we don't consider clothing and extra stuff, items and stuff like that. In Nisab of Qurbani, you have to consider it. So meaning what? More people will be giving Qurbani all over the world. This is why it's important to recognize that. There is very few people under my estimation, a humble estimation in, in America, that people don't have to give Qurbani. It's generally the case that people would have to give. Okay? Very few instances where it's not in things of debt, whatever. Might, might come, come into consideration there, okay? But even if a person were to get the money on Eid day, if on Eid day you got a little bit of cash to match the nisab, uh, you, you reach that level, 
then what happens is what? You also have to give qurbani on that day as well, okay? A husband can give on behalf of his wife, because when we said uh, male or female, obviously then if the wife has uh, in, um, some finances, she has a bit of, of, of things at home, then the husband can give on behalf of his wife if she allows it, okay? If she doesn't allow it, she wants to give her own, all right, you're on your own. You know, even as a husband, like, oh, I forgot to ask you, honey, why didn't you ask me? And then she gets upset and then she has to run and go get her qurbani, whatever, right? So a husband can give on behalf of his wife and vice versa. It's also possible, right? A father can give on behalf of his baligh children if they want as well. <clears throat> children, because I know, mashallah, some of these kids in America, actually, when they start to earn, they want to give their own qurbani because it feels like a rite of passage for us, right? A feeling that I'm actually doing what a Muslim is supposed to do. So encourage your kids. They want, mashallah, if they re reach that amount, Ask them to give like a small one. Don't have to give them like the $400 doing the meatpacking type of thing. You know, go to like you know, much cheaper countries, much like I can get you a qurbani for like 70 bucks. You know, you can probably hit 50 if you, if you, if you bargain with me, if you like to haggle a little bit. I'm joking, I don't, don't do it. Okay, that's like totally opposite of qurbani. Okay, um, you're now required to give on behalf of small children. So it's highly rewarding. And I think that we have a tradition that we just give on behalf of everyone in our family. And it's a good thing to do. We give these things with niyyah. When you give it on behalf of your children, always make niyyah. Allah, Allah raise them as pious children, as, as salih children, as children that will become the qura ta'ayin, the coolness of eyes for the parents. And you'll see it inshallah. This is again a very accepted act by Allah. Okay? When you made the intention to give the qurbani and the month of Dhul Hijjah starts, the Prophet ﷺ said, when any of you cites the moon of Dhul Hijjah and, and then you intend to offer a sacrifice, then let him not touch his hair and his nails. At that moment, meaning that Tuesday night, right, for us here, a Tuesday night when uh, the moon is sighted, basically after Maghrib time, make sure you take care of everything pre-Maghrib, okay? You know, like Ihram, same exact thing, right? When you, a person goes for Hajj, what do they do? They, they shave and everything, they take care of everything pri prior to putting on Ihram. Once they put on the clothing of Ihram, they don't touch the hair and the nails anymore. So you want to do the same thing. Why are we doing this? Because it's replicating the Haji. That we're showing Allah in a, in, a, in a way that, Ya Allah, I wish I was there. And this is my effort, my niyyah to, to show you that, Ya Allah, I wish I was there. I would do the same thing as the, as the Hujjaj. Okay? One kid asked me, and it's, it's recommended. I'm not going to say it's, it's fard, right? It's, it's, a, it's a recommendation. Um, the Hanbali is considered to be wajib. And if he, uh, the Shafi is considered to be makru, to, uh, to shave, whatever. Malik is permiss permissible. They said it's jais. And uh, uh, Hanafi madhab, our madhab, it's, it's mustahab. It's recommended to do it. When I, when I say this to one kid, he's like, it's just recommended, right? So it's not really like important. <laughs> you know, there, there, there are people that, you know, that had died in COVID-19, became shuhada, you know? And I, I stress this point because they would have loved to be in my position right now. And they would have loved to not trim or shave their hair because why they want to receive that ajr. They're receiving it in the graves now. They're seeing every single action they did. Don't take it as, oh, just mustahab and then I miss out and then on qiyamah I realize that this was, reward, this was a lot of reward. I could have done it here. So we try our best to make sure we do it here before we get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah make it easy for all of us. Which animals, inshallah? Uh, the animals are four types of animals. You can choose between male or female, whatever, are permissible for qurbani. You can choose between a, a camel, uh, a cow, or a uh, bull, ox, or buffalo. They're basically all in the same category. And so the camel will be five years of age, which we generally don't deal with camels. We're going to just talk about cows and goats and sheep, okay? So cows will be about two full years of age. A goat or a sheep or a ram will be one full year of age, but a sheep that is between six months and a year, but it looks like a one-year-old sheep, which is generally the situation when you go to these places, you'll notice that the animal looks like it's one-year-old, which is acceptable, which is acceptable in that regard, okay? So what are we trying to stress here? You should actually see your animal. You should see your animal, okay? So the healthy animal has to be chosen, okay? It has to be free of all defects. In general, it should not be born with defects. It should not have a severe defect that you're like, this animal doesn't look like it's, it's uh, it, it, it itself looks like it's sick. And why would I want to eat such an animal, right? It looks, it looks like itself it's dying, you know? It doesn't look like something that's acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Keeping those three things in mind. So if his ears are missing from birth, right? You have to check the ears. If a horn is broken off from the root, right? That's also something you need to check. If the animal is born with no horns or the horn is, born, is broken off, then, and the root remains intact though, the use is permissible. Someone told me that when they were, when the goats were younger, they shaved off the horns, right? They shaved off the horns because they want to keep them low because then they would attack each other, whatever, right? He asked if that animal is permissible. I said, yeah, it's fine because the roots are still there and they just shaved it off because of safety reasons. And that's completely fine too. I know this might click for some certain people. So it might not click for other people. It's completely fine inshallah. Blind in one eye, uh, blind, blind, one eyed, loss of more than one third of its eyesight. In other words, what you're supposed to do is you're actually supposed to open the eye of the goat 
and check the eye. See if it's working properly. You know, you're supposed to check the ears, you're supposed to check the horns, you're supposed to even check the teeth, okay? Absence of a tail. If one leg is tame, uh, one leg is lame, I'm sorry. It's, it, it's, not, it's not able to use all of its legs, okay? Um, it, it's sick to such an extent that his sickness is apparent on his body. No teeth or most of his teeth fell out, right? Bichara is already elderly. You're trying to kill him off because it's, it's easier for you, okay? So, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we have to consider here, okay? So the point is that, you know, mashallah, we sometimes give animals overseas. And I know the reason why we do it is, mashallah, it's number one, it's, it's easier. Definitely it's easier Second, because you trust the people that are doing it for you, convenience, whatever. Second thing is that it does, it does go almost directly to the poor, sometimes to a madrasa where there are orphan uh, students, whatever, uh, kids are learning to learn the knowledge of the deen. That's also good, mashallah. I'm not saying not to do it, but at the same time, consider this. Just get one animal here too. Why not? I, you know, you can find cheaper options. Again, there are always cheaper options. You don't have to just take the one right here. But getting your own animal, checking your own animal is part of the sunnah. It's actually part of the sunnah, okay? The timing of the udhiyah, and we'll get to the sunnah in a second. The timing of the udhiyah is from the 10th, 11th, and 12th. You have to do it within those three days. The 10th, which is the day of Eid, 11th, and 12th. Those are three days that you have to get it done within, okay? And so the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever sacrifices before the prayer, let him repeat it. Everything has to be done afterwards. Okay, now the question will come if it's done in another country, because what happens is what? The country will have its Eid before ours, right? And so technically, before we pray to Eid, sometimes the Qurbani will be done. It happens, right? So for example, in Bangladesh, they'll, they'll slaughter the animals or sacrifice the animals one day basically before us, right? They'll do it basically at nighttime, whatever. Okay, so if it's done in another country, it depends on where the Qurbani is being performed. Okay, so in other words, if in Bangladesh, right, just giving that example, if in Bangladesh the Eid already happened, Eid Jamaat happened, okay, and then they slaughtered the animal in Bangladesh, that's Jayas, even if in America they didn't perform the Eid yet, okay, again, if it's in the country, if it happened, the Eid Jamaat happened within the country or locality, whatever, then thereafter they can perform it no problem whatsoever, okay. The easiest situation is actually in villages, because villages don't even have Eid Jamaat, right, City, cities have Eid Jamaat. Villages don't. So sometimes even in a village, they'll just do Qurbani real quick. Right after the time of Fajr comes in, they just do it. And it's completely done and that's completely fine too. Because in the area of the village, there was no Eid Jamaat to begin with. Okay? So if Bangladesh will consider the Eid timing, Saudi, etc., whatever. And it, even if it falls later than Eid, for, oh yeah, and the opposite, if you did it in, in the U.S. and this happened, right? Certain people were just waiting for the Qurbani to be done in America. Right? Sometimes, and this is part of the training, Sabr. Right? Sometimes it's just, you're wondering like, how in America do I have to deal with waiting five, six, seven hours for my Qurbani? It happens, right? And so if it hasn't happened yet, you have to wait till that's done and then you can start trimming and clipping and whatever. You have to wait till that's finished. Until that animal is not sacrificed, you can't touch those things afterwards and you can start to trim and shave, etc. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay? And be patient. Allah you know, tests in different ways. Now the ideal method for the animal is that you should take care of the animal yourself. Okay? Choosing a castrated animal because the meat is tastier. I'm not sure myself personally. That's what I read in the books. Okay. I haven't really tried and tested. You know, I'm not that type of connoisseur. Okay. So like a good animal for sacrifice. Okay. It is preferable that the animal, you take it yourself. You nourish it. You become familiar with it. You name it a good name. Like you name him Shat, which means goat. Or, or Bakar. Call him Bakar. Here you He's my Bakar. And then, mashallah, at the time when you sacrifice, you actually feel a little bit of the... The pain, right? Like it was my pet, right? And then it just goes, right? Pre-sacrifice, what you want to do is, the Prophet Sallallahu said, we do everything excellently as Muslims, as beautiful as we can make it. And I know people have this complaint about certain slaughterhouses in America too, that they don't look like when they slaughtered, they don't look as Islamic as you want it to be. Mind you, we're still trying to get to the ideal. It's, it's a work in progress. Don't, don't think that it's invalid if you don't have these things, but these are things that we want to see, inshallah, okay? You don't want to see the animal hungry. You don't want to see the animal thirsty. You don't want to see that the guy sharpening the tool right in front of him, like, get ready for the chainsaw massacre, right? Let's get ready for it. And then he's sharpening the tool in front of him. Don't, don't see that either. Don't see him sacrificing animals in front of other animals. Because, bichara, my ahi, my brother just died, and now I'm going to the next one too, right? It's a traumatic experience. We're trying to be as humane as we can in sacrificing an animal, okay? Show that to the vegans and vegetarians, right? Skinning, the, skinning while movement exists, ex exists. You, can't, you can't start you know, skinning or any of the other processes until the animal's properly dead, right? until it's properly dead. And ill treatment of the animals in pens, you have to be very careful of that. There should be no uh, bad treatment of animals. And dragging animals on his back, like dragging it to like its, its death, that's not what we do either. 
the best way is actually to bring into this false sense of security. The animal kind of thinks like everything is fine. You know, and I, I've done this, you know, I sacrificed my one animal, I sacrificed a cow. It's amazing how Allah Ta'ala made these animals so submissive. And it's an experience that we have to bring to our children so they realize that we're not just being homicidal maniacs. We, we like killing the Qurbani and the Baqar and the, the Shat or whatever. Right? Well, the thing is what? That the animal actually submits very, very easily. It's amazing the miracle of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. There's like videos of it on YouTube too, like about people just submitting animals because they just, Allah Ta'ala made them like that. You know, Allah Ta'ala knows best, of course. Okay, how to slaughter? Okay, you do it with your own hands. <laughs> this is actually from the Sunnah too. If one is unable to slaughter, even to the point the Prophet Sallallahu told, uh, say that to Nafatima Radhiallahu that you should go and witness your own slaughter. I know we daren't, generally don't bring our women folk there because we have our own reasons for, but even the Prophet Sallallahu and even other Sahaba Radhiallahu actually told their families to come and witness the animal sacrifice because it is a family thing. And I know it's ulama in America too, mashallah, they try to bring their family to see it because it is a tradition of the Muslims. Okay, so we should consider these things and our kids will get much more used to the blood if you bring them much earlier, they're just like, oh, it's just like, it's like soda because it kind of comes out like that. You know, kids say weird stuff when it comes out. I'm, I'm not, not going to expose too much of my <laughs> background. Okay, he's fine. Okay. If one is unable to slaughter, it is advisable that he witness or she witness the sacrifice. It is not necessary to make the niyyah at the, uh, of the Qurbani verbally, but you must say Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. You must say the name of Allah verbally. Okay. The dua before the sacrifice, as we know it, it's a long one. That's the first one. Inni wajhatu wajhin ladi fatara samawati wal ard ala milat Ibrahim Hanifa wa ma ana min al mushrikin. I'm happy to share this with anyone, of course, inshallah. The simple one that you could say is Bismillah, Allah Akbar, and Allahumma taqabbalhu minni kama taqabbalta min Habibika Muhammad wa Khalilika Ibrahim alayhi masalatu wa salam. Right, the dua after the sacrifices, may Allah Taala accept it from me, just like how you Allah accepted from me. The same way you accept it from your Habib Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and your Khalil. Your friend Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay, this is the dua that we make for the Qurbani. After sacrifice, post sacrifice, what do we do? Okay, the animal's dead, right? You finished it, it's now on the ground. It is not jayas to sell any part of the Qurbani. You want to remember that. Okay, the Prophet said it's not allowed to give anything as compensation. It is again, fi sabirillah. Fi sabirillah means you don't take any portion of it back with you, you don't spend any of it on the dunya. Okay, so you're not allowed to sell any parts of it. So this will come up, a certain question will come up in a second. To eat from the Qurbani, okay, the Prophet ﷺ, this is a sunnah, that you actually eat from that portion, that's actually the first meal you should have after the Eid Jamaat. You go home and actually you have from that. I know in America it's very hard again, we work with whatever we can. I'm not saying to starve all day, I'm not saying to fast on Eid day, okay, but whatever is possible within that range, if you need your chai and biscuits, I'm your guy. I totally understand that. So inshallah, like, just make sure whatever you can do within reason, inshallah, okay. Uh, the divisions of the meat, it is recommended to divide the meat into three, one for consumption, one for gifts, and one for charity. Okay, so meaning one part that you eat, kulu, wa tasaddaqu, right? The Prophet said, to eat, wa tasaddaqu, and the Prophet said, wa at'imu, and to feed others, right? You can feed your non-Muslim relative, uh, non, I'm sorry, non-Muslim neighbors. That's also jayas. You can, uh, you can give your neighbors in general. I recommend that because it's a good way, not just give them like meat, hey. <laughs> Uh, hey Frank, <laughs> he's a shank, you know, of a goat. Like, it'd be weird. Like, don't do something weird, okay? But um, you can give gifts, and if you want, you can keep the entire thing yourself. I know it's not a very popular opinion around here, but uh, mashallah, you're allowed to do it. I'm not saying you can't. Just mustahab is a gift, one third, one third, one third, of course, inshallah. Eat it all, bismillah, you know, treat it like your Ramadan Eid, whatever, okay? If important note though, if it is sold, then the money should give in sadaqah, okay? The butchers will regularly take the skin. The butchers will take basically all the parts you don't take, the butchers will take it, okay? And so there's, there's, an, there's a clear issue here, obviously speaking, because the butchers are not allowed to take it, right? Why are they, why are they not allowed to take it? Because it's your animal. The only job they're supposed to have is what? To, to slaughter, right? The thing is that, what are you going to do with all the skin, right? What are you going to do with the, the hooves and the stuff? What, you have to kind of like, you're only interested in the meat, right? So the idea here is that when you go to the butcher, the intention you have is gifting that those parts to the butcher, okay? When you have that intention that, okay, I'm going to take only the meat and whatever else comes out is my niya of a gift for the butcher, then this will be permissible, be jayas for him to take it. Or else both of you will be in a type of guna, which is a sin, which is not okay, okay? It's not permissible to sell these parts to him and you earn, you earn a really great reward by Allah because you gave a huge gift to him. He's going to sell the skin. Uh, he's going to sell those parts and that's completely fine because it's a gift to him. He can do whatever he wants afterwards, okay? Just keep that in mind, inshallah. 
The question is, can I purchase a live animal? Can I purchase a live animal? Okay. Um, purchasing a live animal is that when you purchase it, uh, you or purchasing it by, uh, by weight, the animal has to be weighed and priced. Okay. You have to agree on a price and generally you do it by the weight of the animal. Okay. So this is, a co of course, there's a difficulty in this. And Shella, anyone has any questions, please, again, put it in the, in the group, uh, in, in the group or afterwards. Just hold the question. You can, you can also ask directly. Okay. Um, so if you are purchasing the animal, you have to actually weigh the animal. And again, it's very problematic for butchers in America because of the fact they don't have that type of scale. They don't use that type of mechanism. So as long as you're agreeing on a price, there are a lot of things that we're going, we have to like kind of, you know, ebb and flow kind of budget it. Okay. So because of the situation of, of the butchers here. Okay. If the animal is selected and agreed, agreed upon and the weight is whatever, then this is permissible. Okay. You have to agree on all these things. You have to agree on all these things. So now here's a problem here. When you buy it, do you even talk about the animal? Very rarely, right? If not at all, we just kind of give the money and just whatever comes as a standard, we just take it, okay? There is, a, there is an issue here because you have to actually select an animal, okay? So now, the, again, it's not the most ideal situation. The ideal situation is that you and I chose an animal It actually has a sticker or a marker on it that has like your name, Abdullah, whatever, and then you know that's your goat that's going up. The thing is that what? Butchers in America, what they'll do is, they'll just say, okay, this is this group, 30 of these cows or these goats or whatever are going to be sacrificed together. And then all those people on that list of 30 will be given one of these animals, okay? So you actually don't know which one is yours a lot of the time, okay? So then the best situation is what? You actually go there and you pick your animal out for yourself and then you try your best and shall again, you try your best. If they, if, they, if they mess it up, don't worry, your reward is of Allah and they'll get whatever they get, right? But if it, if it is in a situation where the 30 animals are going and your 30 list, your names are there, then at least you can say, at least shara'an, you consider your qurbani to be done. You can consider it to be done. Why? Because you know that at least one of your animals was sacrificed on behalf of those 30. Does that make sense? So you can say, at least confidently speaking, that at least my animal will be done. I know because this is a situation here, right? So this question was asked to me, and this is what we found out in terms of um, the ruling. Allah knows best, of course, okay? Um, it is not permissible just to weigh the meat afterwards, like we just talked about. You have to agree on all these things prior to it. It's not the most ideal situation. But as long as you agree on something, you should be fine. The next question is, can I give a qurban in behalf of my deceased relatives? Of course you can, right? The Prophet ﷺ did so on behalf of his ummah, right? The bold, he said, I, Ya Allah, I give this animal on behalf of myself and, the, and he gave another animal on behalf of the ummah, meaning the ummah that's alive and dead, right? And even us, we weren't, we weren't born yet. Technically, we we're also dead. The Prophet ﷺ gave it on our behalf too. Because he loves us so much, Ali Salatu Salam. Okay? And even though and the Ummah that did not perform the Udhiyah, the Prophet did it specifically on behalf of them. Okay. And so there are there are many ways of proving it. Again, there are um, but this is a madhab agreement amongst all four madhahib that you can give a qurbani on behalf of the deceased. Okay. Ali Radhiana, by the way, he sacrificed two rams. And they asked him, Why why are you doing two? He said, The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu gave me instructions to sacrifice on his behalf. So I'm sacrificing on his behalf. It's hadith of Timid Abu Dawood is a good hadith. Okay, Ali Radhi used to sacrifice on the Prophet Sallallahu behalf. Okay, now the question about seven people and stuff. I, I um, let's see. Yeah, if if, it, if you have less than seven people on a cow, can you do that? Yes, you can. In other words, like there are five people on one cow, you paid a little bit more. You can do that as long as the, there's equal weight for each each person. In other words, if there are five people on one cow, and there's like let's say it's a twenty five hundred a pound cow, whatever, and so each person gets like five hundred pounds or something like that, they'll work out. Okay, and so you have to just divide it evenly. So you can have less people, you can have three people, you can have two people, you do one for yourself. If you got that type of money, mashallah. Okay, I, kind of weird, I don't know what you can do with that, but you know, go ahead, okay, inshallah. Can I give a sadaqah instead of qurbani? No, okay, we talked about it in the beginning anyways, but just remember that it's not a badal, it's not a replacement. What happens if I miss Qurbani? Okay, and this is becoming a situation right now. It's very prevalent in COVID-19 situation here. The certain people cannot find a place to give the Qurbani. Okay, so if you miss us, if you miss the Qurbani, and even if you realize that, oh wow, I missed a lot in my life, and I want to make that up, do I just start slaughtering like 10, 20, 30 animals? No, just just give sadaqah. Don't don't look like a murderer. Just give one or two. You know, just I mean, just uh, give the sadaqah on behalf of it. Right, that's all you do. Okay, so give sadaqah for those years that you missed. Okay, so in the situation where an Allah protected, the person should ideally wait till 10, 12, 11, and 12, meaning of Eid, of, of, of Dhul Hijjah. If he could not find an animal on 10, 11, or 12, thereafter, okay, I'll give Sadaqah. Okay, but wait. 
because perhaps Allah will send an animal from Jannah for you. It can happen. Allah Ta'ala knows best, right? You don't know where the situation might turn out to be better, okay? So you don't give multiple qurbanis, you just give sadaqah for those years, okay? And the last but not least, inshallah, and then we'll open up for questions. The day of Arafah, of course, we know, mashallah, fasting on that day of Arafah, which is the ninth, right before Eid, right? If you fast that day, it will forgive the sins of the previous year and the forthcoming, meaning the, the following year. What that means is Allah Ta'ala will protect you from sins. You'll be given a protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hopefully, inshallah, through this fasting, Allah will protect us from all sins, inshallah, in the next coming year. And it's an amazing thing to do. The best supplication was made on Arafah, of course. The Prophet taught us this type of dua. La ilaha illallah wa ahdu la sharika la. Lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamdu wa ala kulli shayin qadir. Right? And this is the dua the Prophet taught us. The takbirat al-tashriq. Right? You have to start doing your takbirs. It starts from the ninth fajr. Allah, 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 after every fard prayer. I'm telling you the hardest one is the fajr on the day because you everyone forgets. Okay. Um, you recite the takbirat of tashriq after every fard salah with jamaat or individually. Every place you do it. Okay. You start from the 9th of the hijjah all the way to the 13th. So about five days you're going to be doing it for. All day to basically the asr of the 13th day. Okay, so three days after Eid basically. 11, 12, and 13. And you only have to do one. That's what we try our best to only do one. But you can do three, five, ten. Go ahead. You can go crazy you want. Inshallah. Go majinu. No problem. You can do that. But again, we try our best to just do the wajib so people know the wajib is just one. Okay. Afterwards, you can do as many as you like. It's recommended to do so. And women, inshallah, should recite it quietly, inshallah. Okay. That's what the of tashriq. Uh, you stick to your okay, so that's a, that's whatever. Okay, inshallah. We ask Allah for tawfiq and guidance, allow us to give the uthiya properly, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and allow us, inshallah, to follow the sunnah of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. And inshallah, hopefully, through this uh, type of amal, we get our connection with him, inshallah ta'ala, on the day of judgment and in Jannah, inshallah. I mean, ya Rabbi, I mean. uh, are there any questions, inshallah? Uh, yes. Nice. Um, do you want to give on his behalf? I, I'm offering him, but he's very adamant that he went to the ATM to couldn't get the money. He wants to pay the money. Yeah, so like, don't worry about the money, but he's adamant. If you're okay with letting him borrow, then. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, my, my humble opinion is that you, as a gift, give the money and then let your dad buy it, whatever one he wants. That would be the best thing. Yeah, it's fine. But again, I, best, best thing would just be that your son, Alhamdulillah, he's very happy to do it on your behalf, uncle. So if... <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's, it's done. If he does it, as you, he becomes wakil for you. So we spoke about it earlier that your children can do it on behalf of the parent. It's up to him, I can <laughs> That's between you and him, inshallah. Either way, it's fine. It's completely fine, inshallah. Allah make it easy, inshallah. Ah, very good. Good. And he then said, hey, I'm not going to take the Qurbani, I'm not going to buy the horse from here, I'll take the over here. Right. Uh, one question. Second question is that... Well, what was the first question, I'm sorry? Is the last it... question was that when one time I went in Massachusetts, uh -huh. it was another Muslim brother, he went also with me to choose the... Enemy. Yeah, yeah. And, and he see the pig next um, in, the, in one of the cage over there too. Right. So he said, well, they are both together, you know, in the same farm. Right. So it's not a permissible, like, part of the so, Okay. He out yeah, so it's a very good question. If there are haram animals on the farm, right, and you are worried that your animal will be contaminated, it's completely out of your realm of taqwa to say, I don't want to buy from here. There's nothing wrong with that. 
right? If if the person on the other hand said that I want to sacrifice still, I still want to do it here. There is some karaha, some makru because of the fact that the animals are mixing, right? And the blade, who knows if the person is cleaning it properly, etc. That's also there. Can you say that the qurbani wasn't done though? No, the qurbani will be done. Islamically speaking, sharan, shariatan, will ho jayenge. Will zaba ho jayenge. Bismillah, will parliya, so it's going to be fine. Right, but in terms of it being the realm of taqwa, taqwa would say that you should probably choose somewhere else just so you, you know your animal is clean and things like that. But it wouldn't be wrong to do it. Okay. Yeah, so again, if you know, inshallah. Right, then there won't be a problem there. If the if the knife is clean, everything else is cleaned up, then it should be a problem. In terms of its walking, that's a very strange thing. Like are we like, oh, this like animals haram and therefore halal animals can't walk there. It's a very strange type of concept. And then if like Abu Jahl is like a haram guy, and you know, like the process walked where he walked, you know, like it's a very weird thing to say. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, right. um, so, but do I have it obligatory that first I have to do at the same time, on same uh, your mind also, and then uh, only I can, if I want, I can do the half of the other. Sorry, sir. Very good question. The question was that um, do, do I have to give on behalf of myself and then the Prophet? Sorry, sir. And then my father, etc. The same year. Yeah. So again, you have to make sure your first, first and foremost, our obligation needs to be done. Don't concern yourself with the dead unless the living are taken care of. Okay. So agar agar qurbani then we can start to say that for the dead person, for uh, for Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu for our father, whatever we can do. But first, make sure your obligation is done, and thereafter you can say, okay, this hissa is for the be sorry, this hissa is for my father, etc. Yeah, 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 sure. No problem, sure. Okay, if I want to do Qurbani on behalf of someone that is alive, can they cut their hair and nail? Um, so if a Qurbani is being done on behalf of them, it is recommended that that person should not shave or trim their nails, okay? So they should be careful uh, for them, inshallah. But if you're, and of course we should have our own done, so we should not be doing it anyways, okay? But again, it's, uh, yeah, so making sure that if the Qurban is done on their behalf, they have to do it. And for us, inshallah, we can also uh, be careful of the nails in here, inshallah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, wait. Wait. No, it's actually, so the question is, that, is there a minimum weight? There's no minimum weight. The main thing is, uh, how old is the animal? Okay. So if the animal is old enough, you don't have to worry about any of those other questions, inshallah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, the question is that if you can uh, give it to the poor, uh, basically not see your animal and just give it your, your share. Directly. Yeah. So the question is that can you just give your your um, your share or your portion of animal to the poor directly without even seeing it? You can do that, inshallah. It's completely fine. It's a gift. So that's fine, inshallah. If you don't want to eat any of it, you don't want to take it out at all, you can do that too, right? It's just sunnah to take a little bit from it. That's from the sunnah of the Prophet. One third, right? One third, actually. Uh, good question, Masha. Very good question. Any other questions? Right. It is true. It's a very good question too. We'll we'll check into it inshallah, we'll look into it. We still have some weeks. Maybe possibly you can create like that food bank um, food bank option. It's a really good option, so. Uh hopefully inshallah something actually comes up too. Uh any other questions for anyone online? 
uh, the, how many days you have to observe the restriction of the nail and the, uh, and the hair? It's just from the beginning of the Hijjah to the 10th. So, yeah, from Tuesday to basically next uh, next Friday, Friday after. Basically till your Qurbani is done, right? So about 10 days or so, maybe 10 days or so. Any other questions? Uh, okay, yeah, if you want to give different share, like you want to give one animal overseas as like the, the parts, yeah, and they want to give one animal here, yeah, you can give like the two thirds with that animal and one third for yourself. If you want to do it like that, you want to estimate the amount of meat, that should be fine too, inshallah. You can do some type of uh, mixer like that, that should be fine. Okay, inshallah, I think we're right about end of time. Okay, may Allah give us all tawfiq, inshallah, Allah accept all our qurbanis. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.